Hi, my name is Kat Chetty and my pronouns are they, them. I'm currently an MFA candidate at the Florida State University in the MFA Studio Art Program. Um, this podcast is called DIY Excess and it is born out of a moment of frustration that occurred um, during the shutdown of some of the conferences that happened during the pandemic. Um, so I had originally had a panel planned, which is supposed to happen this year in Baltimore, um, talking about how to make academia more accessible and to rely less on bureaucratic and institutional solutions and look at it as a more of a collaborative um, case-by-case basis. And so the premise of this podcast is to have open-ended conversations about um, a variety of different topics and we think about access in a really broad sense including things other than disability so thinking about access to um, art making equipment or other sources of um, disparity like food access housing and um, things like that so um, without further ado i have three guests that i was very excited to speak with Andrew Kowalski, who is teaching at the University of North Florida, um, Cody Hinkle, that um, she was a former student of Andrew's, and this is how the project got started, and it was a conversation between the two of them that then included another student, John Stowe. Hello! Can you hear us? Uh, oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah! Yep. Yeah. Change my name. Hey, Cody. What's going on? Hey. I like your hair. Thank you. Looks good. <laughs> Let me open your tattoos. I mean, I, I like everybody's hair. <laughs> I like Cody's hair. I'm more, I'm more familiar with this, the general state of Cody's hair. So this is. <laughs> um. So this is going to be kind of informal, but um, I'll go ahead and like really briefly introduce everybody. I'm probably going to end up doing my own little intro that I add on to it. Uh, but mostly I'm interested in the project that you all worked on together and like talking about how that process kind of emerged and the steps that you went through. And I'm going to ask a few questions here and there. Sound okay. good? Um, just to clarify, it seems yeah. like long ago. And hi, Andy. Hey, hey John, ago. sorry, I didn't recognize you without your hair. That's better. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> better now what's going on <laughs> yeah and cody like i haven't seen you and talked to you in so long too and um i guess like to just jog my memory real quick uh what we were working on um <laughs> i guess i could have, like re ask more about you know for more details uh specifically what you were thinking of the project it was a screen printing project um it was the setup that you helped cody with um, and just Andy, talk. was it me? I felt like that you had I, kind of set up the. Well, I think I, I mean I think that that's maybe a starting point for what dog about because I think Cody, you'd agree too. It was pretty boring, you know. It's like it was like a pretty nominal <laughs> thing, you know. Like, um, but I, I I guess Cody, maybe you should introduce uh, yourself. Yes. I don't want to speak out of turn with. Uh, you know you know why we had to have a setup in the first place but you know maybe you introduce yourself and then we can kind of jump back and forth but I think from there maybe Kat we can talk about some of the larger things so that story is pretty it's pretty it's pretty quick honestly yeah <laughs> uh, go for there. it it's uh, just... yeah go ahead um <laughs> yeah and I I was thinking about this earlier because I was just like wow you know thinking about we were talking about you know the process that went into making this thing and it's really just <laughs> not an elegant solution uh it was a cheap solution and it was exactly what it needed to be um without you know costing a lot of money or anything and yeah like no equipment basically <laughs> yeah yeah it was sort of based on what we have right now <laughs> because we weren't going to get anything else so it's sort of like you know you could wait around you know it's like uh, you know um yeah so we just figured we just sort of really rigged it to to work and kind of went from there every time we check in and see if like there was like some new advancement to <laughs> 
what we could add to it in terms of like a couple of screws and another piece of two by four. But yeah, for the most part, it stayed the same. Just kind of lugged it around throughout the whole studio, you know, just like, yeah. So, but yeah, Kat, however you want to um, kick us off or start us or whatever. You yeah. Know, it, if you want to do a, an, an intro, intro or not, or um, if we should just, have we started? Is that the thing? Is that yeah, I think there? I'd like to keep it informal and like really conversational and not fall into like a really kind of bureaucratic kind of register with this and have these be open conversations um, to maybe start other conversations in other schools. And um, yeah. My original idea was that these would be available online um, for everyone so that if they ran into a similar issue in their classrooms, they could um, watch the recording, see how a certain group of people dealt with, with the issue in the classroom, potentially be able to reach out um, and kind of create a network that's functioning in the way that the institutions aren't. And it's because these problems are so um, individual that it's very difficult for us to even expect mm -hmm. institutions to address a lot of these problems. So then it's like, how do you deal with this? So mm -hmm. the way I'm thinking about this entire podcast is a jumping off point from, um, we're at a pretty good point of awareness as far as disability goes. Um, and a lot of accommodations are being made that haven't been for a very long time. Um, but we're shifting more towards a solution kind of mindset now. So um, working on the aware awareness as well, but how do you deal with this in real time? You've got a student in your classroom. Um, and so how do you start off? Like what's step one? How do you go through the process? Um, so first, um, I guess I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kat Chetty. I'm a current student at FSU in the master's program. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm primarily a printmaker, but I kind of dabble in a little bit of everything um, and starting to get my toes wet with some like audio and video things and collaborative projects. So thank you so much to all of you um, for being my first set of people to have these conversations with. Um, this wouldn't be possible without you all. So thank you very much. Um, but yeah, let's go to Cody next. Um, if you want to talk about like uh, whatever you want to introduce yourself with, talk about your practice maybe a little bit, and we'll just go through all three of you real quick. Okay, yeah, um, I'm Cody Hinkle. I have a BFA from UNF uh, in painting, drawing, and printmaking, uh, primarily a, a printmaker. Uh, that's pretty much all I've been focused on for the last couple of years. Um, uh, I do a lot of work with uh, social justice issues. Um, my portfolio was a massive project that evolved into something I hadn't even considered initially. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be continuing on that line of work uh, and expanding that portfolio project in the future, actually. That sounds awesome. Thank you. Um, John, what about you? Well, my name is John So. Um, I recently graduated from SUNY New Paltz with my MFA. Uh, let me see. I guess relevant to what we're talking about today, I was the studio lab tech at the University of North Florida, uh, probably around 2016 to 2018. Um, I also was the, the grad studio assistant uh, at New Paltz. Um, I was in uh, printmaking, but in my own practice uh, is very much interdisciplinary. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of paper making um, and trying to build my own sort of paper making studio. Um, so yeah, I'm into a lot of different things, uh, many hats. Uh, I feel like I'm wearing, you know, take one off and put the other one on, so. Thank you, um, Andrew. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Andrew Kozlowski, you can call me Andy. Uh, I am uh, currently an assistant professor at the University of North Florida, uh, where I teach printmaking, and that's where I met. Cody was my student, and John was the, um, the technician that I worked with. Uh, I started there in 2017, but I've been teaching since 2007, 
six, something like that. I don't know. Um, a lot. I've been teaching a lot. And uh, so uh, my work is, you know, a lot of printmaking and installation work. I make comics and books and things like that. But um, yeah, so um, this conversation is a really interesting one as a teacher, because um, we do focus a lot on research, you know, when you're trying to get a job, you're talking about your research and pedagogy is often sort of second to, to nothing in a lot of ways. It's important, but it's not quite as important. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that people don't realize is that as a faculty member, you are not required whatsoever to have any kind of training to be in a classroom. Um, you can just show up. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to have ever taken an education class whatsoever. Um, and so that, I think, kind of maybe jumping into some of the things that we'll talk about today is probably where we're seeing a, a huge awakening awakening of these things and sort of realization that we don't know what we're doing with some of these things and how to talk about them let alone how to solve problems about accessibility and uh diversity in the classroom because it's you know um it higher education was not thought of that way you know higher education was this thing that was supposed to take place after you were educated, you were educated in K through 12 and then higher education, the idea was, was the idea is surrounded around expertise and, and sort of diving deeper into things. And so now as higher education's taken on more students and more diverse students and new students that have never had access to college before, it's having to kind of reckon with the fact that it's, it's a much larger population and in that population it's much more varied. It's not strictly for affluent you know white males anymore which is good but also comes with its challenges so um but yeah so happy to be here so thanks for organizing this yeah thank you um that was really beautifully said um um so um i'd like you to just talk about like how did this get started from like step one like when when Cody was in your classroom, like how did you walk me through the entire process? Um, well, uh, Cody, I, I feel out of school to, to say, but I mean, do you want to just speak briefly about your about your disability? Oh yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have spina bifida. It's a, a birth defect um, that affects the spine, and so I'm missing some nerves there um, that that didn't quite form and um so I have been using a wheelchair full time since I was about 12 um prior to that I was able to walk with crutches or a walker but as you know I got older and a little bit taller it it got more difficult so I've been a full-time wheelchair user for a while yeah so so that's where it started I mean that was that's really you know um I, I was relatively new. I can't remember, Cody. What was the, what was the first class that we did? Was um, I was in your intro class, your first semester, oh, actually, so at that, UNF. That's like the very, yeah, yeah, yeah. The very first class that I'm teaching an intro. You've never been in the studio, right? You know, yeah. I've barely been in the studio. Um, yeah, and and and. Uh, you know, here comes somebody in a wheelchair and you're sort of like immediately looking around the studio going like, okay, what, what, <laughs> what, do, I, what, do, we, what do we need? What do we do? Um, and it's a weird thing. I think, you know, when I, with anybody in the class, I try to take a tact of, I do use humor as a pedagogy. You know, I think if we can, if we can laugh together and kind of bond us in different ways and, and um, you know, and, and it forms a trust. And so I think part of it is, you know, you'll mess up more times than you won't just trying, but I mean, you can't not try either. So, I mean, just trying to be up front with somebody and talking to, to Cody, it's probably one of the, I don't remember the first thing we talked about, but probably the first thing was like, just saying like, it's kind of probably centered around what do you need? You know, like what works for you? Or just kind of like leaving that door open because we weren't, like, Cody's an intro student. Cody doesn't know what the heck we're doing. So it's like, Cody can't ask for, oh yeah, well, when we get to this, obviously we'll do it this way. It's sort of like, well, you let me know. Like whenever something comes up, we'll talk about it. We'll figure it out. So that was kind of like the main thing. And I will say too, Cody is, you know, it's like one of those things, Cody, I mean, Cody's been in the wheelchair, like Cody, since, since you were 12, right? I mean, it's like, it's not exactly like it's your first time in the wheelchair. I don't know what it's like. You, you know exactly what it's like. So um, you're, 
you know, you were accustomed to coming into environments, you know, that probably aren't suited best for you. But I mean, the question was, now you're a student and you have to work in this studio. So what's going to work for you? So I don't know. What do you remember? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was going to say um, it, it really was a thing of like, we're working together for the first time. It's your first semester there. It's my first semester in the studio, my first class in that studio. So it really was just this thing of like, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll figure <laughs> it out when we get there. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think like, they talked about gonna... <clears throat> I think we yeah, talked about issues are going to pop up and we'll figure it out when we get there. Right. Didn't we? We talked about ADA compliance. We had a chat about that. I wanted, right. to, I wanted to bring that up real quick because I think a lot of people that don't use it aren't aware of like precisely what you just said, Andy, is that they like expect the students to know exactly what they need. So when you approach most accessibility offices, <clears throat> you give them your documentation they certify you and then they ask you what you need and in some situations i mean it's just ridiculous because you especially if you've never been in a space you have no idea what you're going to need so the system right. is set up in such a way that it it is dependent on the student but not in a way that's helpful in my opinion right well it's also not helpful for the for the faculty member to know how like I don't know, you know, you don't want to say, I mean, nobody wants to say the wrong thing to somebody. It's like, you don't know what you're allowed to say or not allowed to say. It's not exactly like it's incredibly clear cut. Or, I mean, there's probably some HR tutorial thing that you've taken, but it's like, that's, you know, some honestly kind of ham-fisted version of that. And then it's like, now I'm actually talking to somebody that's different. Um, John, do you, you taught, right? When you were at SUNY, did you, you yes. taught some classes? So did you have the teaching moment where you go like, you explain, you do a demo and then you explain, you, you explain everything and then you say, since any questions, you know, that moment, uh, you know, they're the like, where I've gotten questions and that made me excited. And then the moments where I didn't get any questions and I knew that like, there are people that just lost it all and it just went right over their head and they're just like now's the chance i'm gonna get so many emails later on like wondering like <laughs> but, but then i think it's like what you realize like when you're a new teacher right it's like you're like oh wait a minute they don't even know what questions they're supposed to ask like i just showed them this thing like they don't even they wouldn't even be able to form a question if they could like i there's a different like I, so now I say to my students I'm legally obligated to ask you if you have any questions even though I know you can't possibly <laughs> it's like it's just like I'm just supposed to like at this point in the script I just say do you have any questions even though I know you can't fill that in even though you're not it doesn't mean you understand it just means you like I don't know what else I'm supposed to do right you know like you have that, that sort of feeling as a teacher you're like oh, how do I you know I guess I did okay you know so um, I've, I've seen a lot of people deal with it like you were saying the afterwards email thing um, and when I was teaching mm -hmm. at my old school I did that a lot too I, I'd say there are no stupid questions um, if you have a question then five other people probably have the exact same question and so by asking it you're going to be helping other people and I think that a lot of them, especially after going through COVID and isolation, are a lot more comfortable like communicating electronically, whether that's email or Instagram, um, than coming to you in person, because we are at, at this point all a little bit socially awkward um, after what's happened. So yeah, I think I think that's sort of like leaving the door open. Like you just say, like, I know you don't have a question now, but I want you to know that like it's okay that you have a question later. You know, like that's this idea of mastery is sort of a, a, a sort of problem of all of it, right? That you have it mastered uh, immediately within the thing. So um yeah. So I guess, you know, as far as intro, uh at that point we were doing, you know, pretty standard. So we did mono prints, we did relief prints, we did some intaglio work. Um 
but I think, oh, the thing I think that Cody and I kind of had a laugh about was ADA compliance. It's like, sort of like, mm-hmm. yeah, technically, technically egress is, is like, you know, the main thing. Like, what, Cody, what did you always say? It's like, well, it just means I can get in the place. It doesn't mean I can do yeah. anything in the place, right? Yeah, the ADA requirements only, only require that I be able to get around, like, navigate through. They don't care if I can actually reach anything. Right, right. Yeah, so... You know, as far as a, as far as like working in our studio, and John can attest to this too. Like the studio at UNF is small and packed. Like we have ninety six classes that run pretty much nonstop. It's ninety students, so it's not exactly like I have space and all the space in the world. You know, plus we have another another um, faculty member that's that's in there working with their classes too. And so it's like trying to, you know, as much as we want to you know, for Cody, you know, it's like, yeah, this is going to be kind of Cody's setup or Cody's space, but it's like, that also can't take up too much. <laughs> like you can't take up too much space, Cody. Like you can, you can have a little bit. So <laughs> um, we found this old like rickety desk, you know, and it was like, well, Cody can, can get underneath the desk. Cody can get the wheelchair under the desk. And we had a, an extra um, glass tab. Um, we have these sort of glass labs. Ours are like kind of in frames. Um, and so we had an extra one. So we put, we were able to put that on the desk. So Godi could have something that could, they could reach right there um, and kind of just use that. And that wasn't too much um, in the way or, or, you know, we could leave that out in the studio and that could work. Okay. And was this the setup for the screen print? Cause that was mostly what we had talked about. <laughs> um. <laughs> so so the, setup, the setup for the screen print um we took that same table and uh john john was like the master of building stuff in the studio anytime we needed something upcycled john was like john build shelves out of this pile of stuff and john would do it and so i grabbed literally not even like one one nice piece of two by four i've grabbed two small irregular pieces of two by four and the drill and i just drilled them into the surface of the table because our screen printing setup is um we just have sort of pieces of mdf with the clamps on them and we just hook the screens and we use we use 23 what are they 2130 screens or something 2133s they're not the 25 36 they're like the smaller boys yeah Yeah, slightly smaller but not the t-shirt not the 20 by 24 t-shirts that it's that sort of one right in the middle so that's what we use and it's all about leverage it's about like being able to just adjust it so all i wanted to do is lift the table up at an angle so cody could get better leverage as they reached um and so that's what we did we just sort of slammed that on there and i think maybe if we got fancy we put a kick on the front of it so that it wouldn't slide off into cody's lap but i don't know if we i don't know if we actually did that or it was just heavy we just ruled it heavy enough to be okay yeah i think um I think we had thought about doing that, like putting an extra one so it could kind of prop yeah, in between, kinda... but it ended up not being necessarily useful, like, or mm-hmm. not not useful, but necessary, uh, basically just because of the weight of the board and everything. Yeah. It, it seemed to stay on there. It did slip a few times off there, but not a, not a big deal. But yeah, yeah, it was definitely easier to do that. Having to reach across, having right. it be flat was just not feasible. Yeah, so I mean, did the two of you, sorry, um, did the okay. two of you like how much consulting went on, like as you were building it? Because you were kind of saying <laughs> you just slapped it on. Like, did you, um, did you just kind of go for it or did you like ask for permission or did you like, you know, hit up John and go, hey, we're thinking of doing this crazy thing? Like, what do you think about, um, you know, does this have, like, were you worried about liability issues? Like, just any kind of random thoughts around like h- how the thing happened because I'm really curious because I'm very much like the same attitude like there's a problem that presents itself and yeah. you use what you have available and you fix it to the best of your ability but um I know that in a school setting you have to deal with a lot of other you know there's bureaucracy there's red tape so was that an issue with this particular situation for you all uh so i, I know you all probably haven't you all haven't had kids right so it's like there's a moment when you go to the ultrasound and they're like i remember we were getting our ultrasound done and they're like well it's not twins and you're like you have this like flash of after panic because you're like oh right i was supposed to, like that's a thing am i supposed to be worried about that and then it's like so like when you said liability, <laughs> like, like, 
all right maybe we should end this podcast because <laughs> oh. I, I, well i mean i'm sure you could be liable for just about anything at this point but I, I guess going back to that idea so this so when cody came in for screen printing that would have been our second class probably because we did that we did litho too you know um sorry if i freeze I'll just, up i'll just chime in at no yeah. point were we doing anything unsafe okay no no. And I, I didn't think so, but I know that yeah. I know some schools can be very, very strict about like every single thing you have you do has to be approved. And I don't know, like that's what I'm asking about too. What kind of yeah. situation were you in? Were you supported? Were you I don't think they I don't know. I, I was so new I wouldn't have known who to ask. I will okay. say that I, I it's sort of like these problems were acknowledged. And I think we had flexibility because of not having a legitimate budget to revamp the studio. Yeah. And I think that's part of like the dumpster diving aspect of it. Like right. <laughs> you go around and you're searching for materials to build things or to do whatever you can. And maybe people kind of look the other way, you know? It. Well, I, I guess I would say too, I, you know, we have health and safety people that come through. And so the biggest thing is the fight when the fire marshal comes through. Okay. So we know that we know, we know those things up and down. And that has to do with egress. That has to do with not putting stuff on top of things to block sprinklers and everything. Um, and our other, our, our other health and safety usually is concerned with um, ventilation and sort of that kind of stuff in, in the studio. All the studios that I've ever been in, and I don't want to give anybody any ideas. So those, those are the main things. Nobody's coming in and like, we have gouges, you know, so like every studio has got like woodcut tools, like stashed in a corner. Nobody's going like, you know, oh, make sure those are all closed up, all ends on, you, yeah. you know what I mean? Like nobody, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, I've never been in a studio that, that does that. And again, I don't want to give anybody any ideas, but you know, it's like, um, so I think that there's, I don't, I won't even say that it's, it's nobody's looking the other way. I think it's like one of those things where, and this may be, you know, the, as, as we think about it, I mean, maybe that's part of it is to say that that's the reason why disability is so under checked because it's not on the checklist. It's sort of like, well, it's not, it's not on the fire code. It doesn't fall under there. It doesn't fall under hazardous materials. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't fall under that. So it, so we don't, we're not checking with that beyond, beyond what we have to, beyond ADA compliance or something like that. Um, we don't, we don't check for it. So it's not exactly like, uh, it's not exactly like that thing. And, and honestly too, I mean, just to kind of go back, cause I was saying like, this is our first, you know, it's like, so Cody and I worked an intro. This is probably, you know, screen printing is probably the second thing we did. I don't know. I, it seems like it would be, but maybe you did lit though. But anyway, at that point, yeah, Cody and I know it. Third, I think. Yeah, it's a third. Like we know each other at that point, whether it's second or third. Like we've been working together for like a year and a half at that point, you know. So it's like we knew each other and talked. And I could kind of gauge like you, Cody. Cody, you know, is capable. Like um, Cody's <laughs> upper body strength is certainly capable. I mean, the MDF board. Like I have trouble lifting it out from underneath the thing, and Cody can do it from a wheelchair. You know, it's like that already. Like that could for an able-bodied person could be considered, you know, you have to move this piece of MDF that's, you know, a sizable chunk, you know, it's probably, you know, 20 pounds or something like that. And Cody could do that. I mean, it's, nobody's batting an eye about that kind of stuff. And so, you know, maybe the worst that would happen is like, you know, Cody was sitting down and like we talked about it, like the way that we just had it propped up, it was propped up by like the, it was a two by four on its side. So that's two and a half inches tall. That's, a, that's as much land as it had. So it's like, it's not going anywhere. It's not made out of anything fragile. Cody's not fragile. You know, it's like just gonna fall, kind of slide into your lap or something. But that was that was about it, you know? So I don't I don't think it was ever, yeah, unless somebody's coming in the studio to like, you know, checking things out. But I don't know who that would be even on campus, you know? Cause again, Cody is not, Cody is not a flammable material and not a hazardous <laughs> material. So, you know, that's like, they're like, that's not my job, so. I think um, that um, I think that that's a major hesitation, honestly, um, and yeah. and that's why I bring it up. It's not I I didn't want to scare anybody, but um, I think that people are so afraid of like you know we're 
people are so lawsuit happy and mm -hmm. um, there's always this like liability issue that hangs over everybody's heads, especially when they're in any kind of institution, whether it's a school or a bank or anything. Um, so I think that that's part of the hesitation towards people mm -hmm. even like making attempts at it. And so that's why I was very interested in the fact that you all were very just like, you know, let's, let's make this happen because a lot of the gap between, you know, the reality of being a disabled person and, you know, getting what you need is that you're waiting for these institutions to do these things. And sometimes they don't even know what you need. So it's, I, I think that this is a fantastic thing that happened. And um, that's why I'm trying to share these stories like this, yeah this might be helpful to someone else in a very similar situation halfway across the country. Um, I wanted to ask if you all had any like diagrams of like the apparatus. I, I know it was very like <laughs> hodgepodge, but um, if you had like a way that you could illustrate like how you set this up, um, I'm sure it's like pretty easy to do. I know you're very busy, Andy. Um, I don't um, even know if it's still, I don't, I don't know if I took it apart. I might've just taken the blocks off of it. Just slide. I will have to see if it's, if the desk is still there, Cody. I can't remember what we did with it. Yeah. But, and you know, you're I, willing to share the other, like the other one I could take a photo of is the, um, the one, the one that we did was the screen coding. Remember Cody, we did screen coding. Yeah. That, that was, I was um, going to bring that up. Yeah. yeah. That was, Can you talk you about want, that a little yeah, bit? Go, you other... want to talk about that, Cody? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so um, a problem that arose when uh, coding screens was that like we would be sitting the screen on the floor and then, you know, trying to pull the, the scoop coder up the screen with the other hand. Well, I couldn't lean down far enough to get the bottom of the screen with the scoop coder. And so we were trying to figure out what to do, whether to prop it on something else or whatnot. And it was also hard to just do it myself in general because the screen would slide as I was, you know, coding it. And so basically it, again, two by fours, <laughs> two by fours solve everything. everything. <laughs> yeah, they solve everything. Um, so yeah, we basically, um, which uh, Andy, you might be able to describe it a little better than I can because you've, you've probably seen it. Mm -hmm. more recently than I have but it's because yeah I mean it's just a bunch of two by four stacked yeah. at varying heights well, we, basically. yeah so again you know a small studio multi-purpose studio so we don't have areas designated for things so we coat you know on the studio it's fine we don't even have to do it in the dark room um that's a myth uh, you don't have to do it in the dark room. So anyway, um, but yeah, I show students the coat from the floor um, and usually, you know, handling them or holding them. But um, what we did is we we built a better mousetrap. We just, I had old roller boxes uh, that housed like wooden boxes for transporting the the rollers in the studio. So they weren't being used for anything. So the, what are they on like five by five, six by six, something like that. Like, yeah, you know, this like long, six, they're kind of long rectangles, about two feet long, about six by six. And what Cody and I just, we kind of took two of them, stacked them on each other. And then to solve the, the screen pitching back as you're pushing against it, we just put a two by four in the back so that when it leans, it pushes against that two by four and it can't go back any further. And so we just put that, we didn't, I didn't even secure it. You know, and to just like just lean it up against the wall in the studio, and uh, and then it was great for other people too because anybody can use it. It doesn't move, you know, so everybody can use. It. I, and I've seen people build, you know, kind of like contraptions to hold screens, and you know, it's like okay, I, it's it's good. I mean, in this case, it really helped Cody because, you know, um, yeah, sure, Cody's got a friend, somebody can do it. But the the awkward part was. Um, like Cody said, if you're holding it, it was too low if it's all the way on the ground and too high if it's on the table because we were coding them vertically. It was the way that the scoop coder was, you know? And so it was like, um, yeah, it was like you couldn't, we couldn't find, you know, if we put it on something else, like a stool in the studio, then Cody can't reach the top, you know? And so it was like, this was just, I don't know, 10 inches off the floor. It's like the perfect height that Cody could get the, the reach down to the bottom and then still have the capacity to get to the top on that vertical. 
and uh that worked that worked fine you know and, and we, i think it's still i think i still have it in the, back, in the dark room actually it's still there <laughs> yeah, I just if, have if you them, you know? pictures any yeah. pictures you have of like this process of building and even if they're just like iphone pics i sure. think would be helpful to people because the my whole mission is to try and help others and spread this information yeah. um yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. Like I hadn't even thought about the scoop coding part, but it does bring up like, I keep thinking about how when we solve these um, issues that come up with disability it inadvertently ends up helping everyone. Like um, we have the um, speech to text. And I mean, people use that while they're just driving in their cars. And that was initially like made as this device to help people who are disabled. And so like, I mean, even in the screen room, I'm sure you have them, Andy, the boxes for the really short students so that they can get oh. up, up to the, yeah. the, the height of the table. And that has nothing to do with like disability. That's just, you know, a difference in height and students. So I think right. it's kind of, I'm also thinking about expanding the idea of like thinking about access outside of just disability and thinking about access as something that is just about equity for everybody. And that if we look at these individual problems and solve them, they might have solutions for much larger populations. Yeah, I've been thinking about accessibility in, in those more in those broad terms too. And I, I guess I, I would put an asterisk next to this to say that you know, yeah, Cody's in a wheelchair, but Cody is is still, you know, very able-bodied and very strong and able to do a lot of things. So I was able to communicate with Cody and see how they feel and make sure they were comfortable and, and work with them and be able to go there. And, and that that's not always the case. You can't, you don't always, you know, that that may not be the case in different people and, and different things. I think one of the things when it comes to accessibility that we run into in a curriculum is the idea that if you are a degree seeking student is different than being a student that is taking a class as an elective or even not even an elective for credit um, as we do have uh, students um, that come in and they are in a program where they basically get to audit a class and, and see what it's like, but they're not taking it for credit. That's different. My wife does that in, draw, in her drawing class a lot. She'll have students in those, in those and in that case, they, she, can work with them and say you do what do what you feel comfortable doing and and work on this and she works with them but because they're not degree seeking because it's not for a grade you know the the burden of well you have to do this project this way and this time to prove that you have the skill base to be able to to get the credit for the class like that's where i think we really run into, into issues because you know our whole system built around you know in semesters is 16 weeks and you kind of have to show mastery of certain things within that time frame well for some students it's you know, the, the idea of even just basic mastery might come, it could come, it could come later, it could, it could just take longer, you know, and so it's, it's, it may not even be, you know, because we're talking about physical disabilities, it could be cognitive disabilities too, you know, um, where it's like, yeah, you can get it, but you just, it just takes longer for you, for you to, to, to be able to kind of process and be able to, to work on it, or we need to go slower so that you can follow the steps. The word, I always used the word confidence with students. I was thinking about the table saw, you know, you first learn how to rip something on the table saw, it's like, you want to, I don't want you to be afraid of that machine. I want you to be confident using it, you know? Um, you know, I want, I want you to be able to feel like when you come in the studio that you feel confident being there. You don't have to know everything, but you feel comfortable there. And that sometimes just takes different speeds to be able to get there. So I think that's where we run into the problem is that, um, yeah, like when you end up, because the other thing too with a curriculum is like, now you're a printmaker or now you're a painter, or you're a sculptor. And it's, it's hard to say, you know, with, with, and this is the part where you can't, you can't say no, you just don't know. But I think our, our curriculums become inflexible at different moments where mm. you have to take these set of classes, but, you know, some students, they, they, they may not be able to, I mean, given the, given the circumstance or given what, what parameters are like, like an example, like, could you, could you get through a printmaking program? But for whatever reason, the only thing you can do is, is you know, hand print wood blocks or something, you know, for whatever, you can't use the litho press, you can't use an etching press, it's just like, it's physically not possible or whatever. Like, 
would we be comfortable in a curriculum to say like, oh yeah, that's good. You're, you're a printmaker now. Like, you know, so what is the value? Like what's the purpose of, of that curriculum at a certain point? Um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing, like, I know John, you've been a little quiet. Um, like you got some recent teaching experiences under your belt. Like, did you run into any kind of these, like, how do you feel about this idea of flexibility in the classroom? Like, I know you're new to forming your, your teaching philosophy, but like, how do you feel about like the conversation we're having? And, you know, is this part of your teaching philosophy at all or anything like that? Well, I, I think to piggyback on what Andy said about the flexibility, I mean, for me, asterisk, I was teaching during COVID or my first class that I, I was teaching there was online. And so I was having to prepare you know, demonstrations online. Uh, I was trying to do them live and record them. Um, but at a, at a certain point, I think by the second semester, I was getting frustrating. I could see like the disappointment and not being able to print for these students. Um, so I had rigged up a glass table cart um, and I started bringing printmaking supplies with me doing sort of like woodblock printmaking, monotypes, um, trying to print. Um, uh, I'm losing the making block you build the block uh, uh, collagraph yes so we were doing that uh but sort of wheeling meeting in a very open space outside and just having students like giving them the opportunity to to see these things in person right in front of them so um yeah as far as like the flexibility and giving them that opportunity or like more time to learn yeah i mean it's it's tough um yeah, that, uh, I'm such a young, young teacher too. I, you know, yeah. I haven't, I don't have the same years and experience. To... Well, it's funny because you don't even have that. Like, you didn't start with an in classroom, so you didn't even know what you were missing at a certain point. You know, so <laughs> it was kind of wild. I, I had a, I have a, 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 a friend and a colleague, um, and uh, they said to me, we were talking on the phone, and they said, uh, we were, it was very early on. I said, well, how are you handle it? We talked a little bit, and he said. Uh, well, you know, when we look at transcripts, we're all just going to see that asterisk next to these these semesters. Like, we're just all going to know. Like, yeah, you had intro at home. All right. So, like, it's not the same. You know, I mean, you could pretend it's the same, but it's not. It's not quite the same. And I don't just mean like physically. Like, when I I've written stories about, it. I've written you know a number of comics sort of dealing with it. But it's like it's not about the physical stuff. It's not about that you didn't have an etching press at home to work from. You know, it's so much more of that stuff. It's so much more about being there, you know, and, and the sort of, there's a lot of intangible. So I don't even, you know, even like the idea, like, oh, the printmaking community, like we talk about those things too. And it's just like any community, just being around people and solving problems, you know, it's like, um, I think it just changes that dynamics significantly, you know? So, I yeah, I mean. Point. Uh, I mean, as far as Cody, I felt like I was a little bit earlier. My undergrad was at UN. So I was there as a student taking printmaking courses and I graduated in 2016. So that was probably right when you were coming in, Cody, right? Um, yeah. Taking an intro class yet, or you were already on campus. Um, but anyways, that collaborative printmaking spirit, right? And, and your first time being in the printmaking studio, I think it was a little bit of everybody, like you were just sort of, I'm going to try and do this. What do I need to do this? And how do I do that? And then having people there, that community that are willing to help you. I think um, that was one of the great things about our program was I felt like everybody was pretty close mm -hmm. and willing, willing to help um, when you needed it. Um, <laughs> so John, you were the go-to guy to, you know, like kind of problem solve random issues. I don't know if I was the go-to guy. I certainly was, I tried to be as helpful as I could. Um, I think it was just a lot of people. That particular time at our program, it was going through a lot of, a lot of changes. Um, and so it was sort of like everybody stepped up to do what they can to make it a better experience for everybody. Um, yeah, I think for you, Cody, a lot of those things like going in is like, okay, we ask you, what do you need? And then being like, I've, sort of not familiar with the process, you're not really sure what you're going to need. 
you have to sort of just start trying to do it and then what do we change sort of on the fly to, to make it uh, more accessible um, like i think like going through the process of screen printing right like coding of the screen the mm -hmm. aspect and then you have to clean your screen and so just one navigating to mm -hmm. the the washout room there's no <laughs> sort of button you can press for the door to open for you while you're holding your screen, you know, and trying to wheel. So like that, you know, in itself, like you may need you help just, just getting in the room. Um, I don't know, how, how did you feel about the washout room? Was it? Uh, not too bad, actually. That was, that was surprisingly not a challenge, not terribly. Um, yeah, the door, the door was a little bit heavy trying to hold the screen with one hand and sort of like prop myself to be able to like pull the door open with the other hand and then, you know, not have it slam on me as I'm trying to get in the door uh, in the room was, that was probably the most interesting part. But as far as like the actual washout setup, uh, it, it was pretty accessible really. I mean, the tray to sit the, the screens in was right there. So, I mean, yeah, that was, that was not too bad, actually. Yeah, uh, and, and they, I'll, I'll give a plug for American French Tool Press. Uh, that's our main, that's our main <laughs> press. It's, I saw Cody, you know, the first time I think Cody's going to print at it, it's like the perfect height for Cody. And it's like, right, right, kind of at the perfect like arm level, you didn't have to like sit up too much you know you could you could act and it's a big press it's like a 36 They're 60 huge. you know it's like a big bed and cody could get access to the middle of it and everything so mm -hmm. um so that was that that press sort of just worked because uh, you know our other press you know you don't get to choose all this. our other press is a conrad and that's a little bit you know that's a little, sits just a, a couple inches higher even you know so it's like you just you know things like that like what are you gonna what are you gonna do with that? So yeah. go to French Tool, put the little stamp of disability yeah. approval on yeah. it. <laughs> it's like the the Cody the Cody approval. I guess. <laughs> it's like... Um, thank you all so much. This is absolutely amazing. And actually, like I'm glad Andy, you started bringing up like the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, like what happened during teaching as a as another episode and how zoom affected that and like you were already alluding to you and john both so if john you want to be part of this conversation i would love to have you um because even being a new teacher like those experiences are really formative and talking about how that's really affected education and maybe how some of those things can be used as good tools like i i've seen a lot of teachers using it as a, a covid tool so we have weeks where we've got students out. I mean, like half the studio will be out sick or quarantining. And so the teacher will just set up the computer and have Zoom open so that those who are sick at home in quarantine can still not miss the material. But I think there's like, we can get deeper into that uh, conversation if the two of you would be willing to do that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I just, I did, I had to do it this week. I was the one out. So I was, you know, I, I was here, I was here in my, uh, my studio. This is, this is my, um, let's see, that's my rig. Like that is my $20 gooseneck iPhone holder is like my producer for all of my Zoom classes. So, I, have the, I have the same one. <laughs> oh, it's all you need. It's all you need. Um, but yeah, it's, I think that that's a really good thing. Cause I, it, it is that, that idea of build a better mouse trap. You know, it's like, there's things that exist. There's things that you can cobble. I mean, I think when you think about like the DIY aspect of it, I think maybe we'd all agree that we don't, you'd want to see systemic change for the better to make things accessible for people to find ways that open these things up. When I talk about a curriculum, I don't know. I think I think it it that's the hard part. But I, I definitely think I can, you know, one of the things I like about teaching comics, I can teach that to anybody anywhere with a pen and a pencil. That's what I think is so be beautiful about it. It's so it's so open. And one of the things I got frustrated with about printmaking was the, the idea of trying to mimic what I could do with the students. Like, well, we, 
what's the point? I didn't teach litho at home. What was the point? I know other people figured it out and, and more power to them, but I just, I figured what was the point of that for me? It um, and making, making that many adjustments to something, I thought, no, I'll just, I can fill two screen printing classes and I'll teach that at home. That made, that, that made more sense. So I, that's, it's all been making me think about the sort of, especially this thing that we love with printmaking, we, we unfortunately do define it by a lot of times by a set of, of tools and things. And um, there's a, 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 a colleague, a, a guy who's a sculptor um, named Michael Jones McKean, and I met him. Um, he was a faculty member when I was at VCU. And uh, he was trained as a traditional potter. And um, he, now he makes like gigantic, crazy sculptures. They're amazing. One, this project just involves the entire earth right now. So, um, but he said this beautiful thing. He said, you know, when you first go into ceramics class, you buy your little tool set. And it's got your rib and your your knife and your sponge and your wire, and he said that's what you need for beginning ceramics. He said, but what you don't realize is that that's that set of tools is telling you how to make a certain kind of thing. It's built for a certain size and for a certain thing, but that's not the only thing you can make with it. And so I think about that as like when we start defining the expectations of what happens based on a set of tools or experiences or methods. That that's not the only thing that we're concerned about, you know, or should be concerned about. And so, I think I can make a making experience accessible to most people, um, you know. But I definitely think, you know, we could we could try in different ways to think differently about curricula that we can keep the arts open to to way way a wider swath of people. I think I think it's just something really to kind of consider to the future. Yeah. I think, I think at, the, at the same time too, the thing I worry about is that, you know, I'm not a trained art therapist either. That's not what, that's not the purpose of my class. I could, you know, when people think of it that way, you can do more damage, you know, than good, you know, kind of getting into things that you're not really supposed to be there to do. So I think that there is a, a balance to be respected within, you know, what, what, what exactly are we trying to do and how do we, what are the tools that we use to achieve that? So I think that those all those things kind of tie in together with like this sort of larger idea, you know, the, but the DIY thing is just first and foremost about being a human being. It's like, well, you need to screen print. So prop this up on that, tilt this this way. I mean, like you said, Kat, it's the same as me saying, oh, you're shorter than I am, go stand on this box, you know? So it's like, you just kind of figure those things out as you go and the idea of not over laboring it, you know, so systemic change takes forever, forever. if ever, if ever. And so like, you know, I don't have, Cody and I didn't have forever. John and I didn't have forever. It's like, here, you need this assignment still do. Like, you know, we so have like, it let's, now. Get, let's, let's get going. So, yeah. So I think that's where the DIY aesthetic comes from. It's just being a human being and talking to Cody and not, not, not worrying about consequences, but worrying, like kind of just having a conversation like, well, how is this going to work for you? Does this work? And being you know, curious, and you're, you know? you're touching on issues that I want to get into later as well, um, talking about like, where is that line between, you know, helping a student and where you're, you're kind of turning into their therapist and you mentioned several other topics. Um, I'd love to get into more conversations with you about these things if you have the time, like as the year goes on, that would be fantastic. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. John, too, I know you're a new teacher, but um, your experiences are valid as well. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic. And I think it's going to be uh, really useful for other people. Um, so I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to edit anything. I'm just going to put it up the way oh. it is. I'm going to do, <laughs> I might take out a few things. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to order transcripts. So we've got like a more accessible um, transcript for people to read. If there's anything you're in particular concerned about, let me know and I can edit it out of the video. Um, but I think we're all okay. Um, and I thank you all so much for your time and your thoughts and your consideration. It's very much appreciated. Oh, thank you, Kat, for getting the conversation going. and. Yeah, I'm sorry that I talk so much. That's it. No, you, you sure in that part? I was steamrolled too much. <laughs> it's all very useful it's, information. <laughs> it might be useful. I don't know if it's interesting enough to listen to it. <laughs> so that's the, I had a friend, uh, my friend Rob said, if you ever want to um, embarrass somebody in an interview, just just um, paste it verbatim. 
don't edit it. So we'll see how this goes. See what kind of feedback we get. <laughs> Cody, what do you want to say? Uh, Cody, <laughs> tell me. Do you have anything here, you want to say? Ending, wrapping up. No, just those. This was really cool and a good opportunity to have a conversation that needs to be had. Um, uh, accessibility in the classroom is getting better, but there's still things to to work on and you know, like, like Andy and I have said, those solutions don't have to cost a lot of money. They can be very inelegant solutions that cost a couple <laughs> bucks, maybe nothing if you've got scraps. Uh, I think uh, John used the term dumpster diving, which yes. I really enjoyed earlier. <laughs> just, yeah, just dumpster dive and see what you can find there before you have to go and spend money on things. Exactly. I will say, I never physically got in any dumpsters. But <laughs> in a strip with art programs sort of like separated, people are constantly sort of trying to make room for other things. So things get thrown out and you're like, oh, that's that's a printmaking ink rack, you know, like right there, that like palette right there, you know, what can I make with that? And I think that's a lot of what it is, is repurposing things to where it's like, the rule is if you build something new, something else has got to go away, right? Mm-hmm. So you turn one thing into another. Um, the, guys from, the, guys from Can- the guys from Cannibal one, one time said, uh, every studio has a pile of sticks in the corner. Yeah. It's <laughs> a <laughs> requirement. John, um, check the pile, pile of sticks. I think every art student would know that you, what you meant by dumpster diving. It's like an end of semester event. Like you wait for it and you know that the undergrads are going to be just putting all their copper canvas and you, you, you have, I had no shame. I would dumpster dive and take the materials I needed. So <laughs> uh, for anybody out there, the, there's untapped potential in uh, <laughs> canvases that don't get collected at the end of the semester. You just take the stretcher bars and you can make something with that. Oh yeah, and screens too. If you've like got a ripped screen, like just take out the mesh and you've got like a beautiful aluminum frame for work. <laughs> I feel like I, I feel like we started another podcast. John, is that <laughs> that's your new podcast, right? It's like you would do great at that, John. I think that's you, John upcycling with John. I think that's good. Got, well, like you dumpster got, diving with John. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you again so much. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and um, I'll email a few of you about maybe setting up some uh, future interviews. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kat. Thank Thank you. you. Bye, have a good day. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us today for the discussion. I hope you all enjoyed it. And I just wanted to say that um, as of this moment, um, the call is open. And so we are still taking possible um, proposals for the panel talk. And there are links on my Instagram to the CCAC entry site for their calls for papers. Um, so the original planned, um, panel is still going to happen. So if you are interested in presenting on the panel, please get a hold of me. Um, if you are interested in contacting the artists or the people that were on the podcast today, all that information will be available. And if you would like a, um, to have a conversation or if you have a topic that you really feel like needs to be addressed centered around the idea of access and um, agency, go ahead and contact me as well. And I will drop my information somewhere below where you can access it. And hopefully um, I will be heard from you in the second episode where we will be having a conversation with uh, Laura Brody and Anthony Tussler about the show Opulent Mobility. Have a great evening and thanks for listening. 